Hello and welcome. Um, my name. Hello. Hi, Mum. Mum. Um, Mum. I'm just. I'm just on the. T Mum. I don't think there's any right or wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It could be inside. Could be outside. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Just ask him to put it outside. Okay. Great. I've, I've got to go. Okay. Love you. Bye. Sorry. Have you ever? So have you ever wondered why we gesture um, when we're on the telephone and no one can see us? Perhaps more telling, why would a child who is born blind still gesture to another child who is blind, as research has shown? The fact is, gestures can do many things. Um, one of the things they can do is they can represent ideas. Sometimes they just echo what we say in speech, but very often they reveal things that we, we don't say in speech. And that can be very interesting. The fact is, we, we nearly all gesture. Um, it depends on many different factors, but we generally um, gesture, especially when we're doing certain things like solving a difficult problem or explaining something to somebody else. In fact, we change the way we gesture depending on our perceptions of how much somebody understands something. Um, I gesture. Maybe um, I gesture a lot. People say that I'm, I'm advertising my research that I do so, but if I have a look at other Tandai talks and walk around any lecture hall in the university or any school, um, Teachers, lecturers, they're gesturing away. But very often, they're not aware. If you ask them, they may not realise they were gesturing. And that's really, really important. Because why is it important for, for science? Well, gestures provide a window into the way we think. Um, they tell us a lot about the relationship between our minds and our bodies. And they tell us a lot about the way we conceptualise ideas. Not just simple ideas like how we count or, or basic ideas like gravity, but really complex ideas, maybe through metaphors. Our gestures can tell us about how we conceptualise things like time or justice or, or data. Um, and very interestingly, these gestures very often tell us about how our experiences shape um, the way we think. Now this, um, this is me. Um, I am Dr Andrew Manches. I've been at the University of Edinburgh now for about seven or eight years. Um, I more typically look like this now. My background is learning sciences. Um, learning sciences is not as common in the UK as it is in places like the US. It's interdisciplinary. It builds, brings together um, psychology, cognitive science in particular, and education, but also domains like computer science and engineering and design. At the core of learning sciences is trying to understand the way we learn and how we can design things to improve the way we learn. Now, my particular focus is the way that young children learn and the way we can design ways to support them, particularly in areas like STEM. So I thought I would start with a quick clip to clarify what I mean by gesture. This is from work by Neon Brokes and others um, in looking at gesture in the US. In the clip, the, the child is given a number problem to solve, and as you can see, they, they start using a calculator, and that, that highlights the way we use the environment to help think. But then they, they continue, continue solving the problem without the calculator, and they start gesturing. And the question I have is, what are they doing with their gestures? So this child is an expert abacus user and the way that they are moving their hands um, aligns with the way that they would manipulate an abacus. So gestures can be really revealing in showing us the way that our experiences in the world can structure the way we think. And this is really important um, when we consider theories of cognition, so theories of the way that we think. Because dominant theories of cognition um, have an a metaphor of the mind a bit like a computer that the world provides really important input and the world is important when we output when we enact what we know but it's ultimately seen as something separate from the mind we have a sort of separation between mind and body and we the language we use often reflects this the way that we you know we have cognitive processing and, and memory and executive function there in the last 20 years there's been growing arguments that we um, that cognition should not be separated from perception and action in the world, that our experiences in the world um, structure the way that we think. So very often this refers to the way that when we have a task 
and we have cognitive activity, we are thinking about something, we use the environment to structure the way we're thinking. We can offload the way we think to the environment. So an example may be the way we use our calculator, or we may be counting using our fingers, or the way that we you know, write down numbers and use our telephone to remember numbers, and, you know, and it saves us having to do it. But then what happens when we don't have these things, when we're just thinking in the absence of, of, of materials or environment to help us? Well, this is where evidence is showing us that even in the absence of this relevant um, information, we still structure our thinking around the experiences we have had in the world. And this is where gesture is really, really important because that's a source of evidence of how these body-based experiences structure the way we think. We can use this to examine the way that people think about different ideas. And importantly for my research, we can use this to look at the way that young children's experiences in the world shapes the way that they think. So I wanted in this talk to share briefly three projects that I have been involved in in the last five or six years that have explored the role of body-based experiences in the way that young children um, develop STEM concepts of so science, technology, engineering and maths. So the first project was funded by the Economic Social Research Council and that was called Interaction, Embodiment and Technologies in Early Learning. This project focused on young children's um, numerical concepts, so children aged about four to eight years old. And the question behind this research was how do young children think about numbers and what type of experiences have influenced the way they think about numbers and use this then to then look at what other experiences could we provide to be able to help children learn about numbers. So we started by looking at different materials. Um, do you know what these are? These are Frederick Froebel, who was the founder of the kindergarten's third gift. Um, and these um, materials are significant in the history of educational technology because they represent an attempt to specifically design um, materials to help young children think about ideas. So here, this gift helps young children think about the way the numbers can be divided into different ways. Now, materials in classrooms um, are not too dissimilar. They may, may be made of plastic, but similar emphasis on the importance of hands-on learning in helping young children learn about number concepts. But with the advent of technologies that allow children to manipulate objects with, with a mouse or just by touch screen, it started raising questions of, OK, what, what is the importance of hands-on learning? What do we mean? Do we just mean be able to move things around? Or is there something about touching, holding them, and moving things in physical space? At the core of this question is, well, how do we think about numbers? What type of experiences shape the way we think about numbers? And so for this, um, we wanted to examine what type of embodied experiences shape how we and children think about numbers. And we created a question, or a set of questions, to be able to help us explore this. So this is a bit of a crowd participation um, activity, um, which may not work quite as well um, in a video, but if you would bear with me and have a go. So we start off with quite an easy one. Uh, what is one plus eight? So assuming you're still with me, um, nine. Next question, what is two plus seven? It's also nine. And the third question is a little bit tricky, and this is where you'd be asked to turn to the person next to you and to answer this question. Can you explain why 1 plus 8 makes the same as 2 plus 7? So this question is, is about a number of relationship, and to answer it and to explain it to somebody, it reveals the way you are thinking about numbers. Now when we have done this um, in an audience, and normally about 50% of people will use their hands um, to explain um, their answer. So this does emphasise that not everyone does. Well, there is research to show that even when we don't gesture, we can still detect twitches in our muscles, indicating that, that we are um, activating um, our motor um, system. We just decide not to express it sometimes, or, or, or we, for various reasons, do not. But where we do gesture, it does reveal a lot. And in one study, we looked at um, 14 teachers um, and asked them the same question. And out of those 14, 13 teachers um, gestured. And the gestures reveal quite a lot about how they conceptualise numbers. Explain to me why 1 add 8 makes the same as 2 add 7. 
because you could take one away from the eight and put it on the other side to the one, making two plus seven. So sharing of Okay. So um, apologies for the, the audio quality there. But what you can see um, is, as the teacher explained, um, they did various gestures. But one very clear one was the way that they talked about taking one from one group and putting it onto another group. And as they did that, their hands pinched and it moved from one space to another. Now, if you're talking about something as abstract as numbers, that, that pinching and moving gesture doesn't make that much sense. But it does make a lot of sense when we think about numbers as if they were blocks. And that metaphor of numbers is really powerful. It really helps us think about ideas such as how a number such as eight could be split into different groups, four and four. But this is not the only way we can think about numbers. And some of the videos show other metaphors. So I wanted to show a clip now of one of the children who answered this question. So this is one of about 114 children who took part in this study. And what their gestures reveal is the different um, ways they're thinking about numbers as they respond. So in this clip, um, do have a look at the way that children use their, their hands um, in the same way as the teacher, and they use the pinching gesture, but also look at the other way that children communicate their understanding of numbers. Because um, it, if you have one and six, that would go to a seven, and five is one less than six, so, and two is the same, and eight, if you took six, and and it would be very complicated if you had six and five. That would make a level. Fantastic, very clever. So again, in that clip, um, we saw something similar about the child pinching and taking numbers, like, like the teacher. But we also saw some other gestures. For example, the child talked about numbers that were next to each other. And towards the end, they talk about um, a bigger number that was all the way over there, and, and their hand moved to the right-hand side. Now this, again, doesn't make much sense when we're talking about something as abstract as numbers, but it makes a lot of sense when we think about how we represent numbers as numbers along a line, and how smaller numbers tend to be on the left-hand side, and far over the right-hand side, you have numbers. So this reveals a lot about the way this child is learning about numbers. So from this research, we saw a lot of gestures and we were able to group them into two um, metaphors of number. And these metaphors map to, to work that's been talked about in numerical development across all ages um, by Lakoff and Nunes. The two metaphors, um, the first refers to, to num numbers like they are collections of objects. Um, so we can talk about taking one away from another, how numbers can split, how collections of numbers. And the other one is numbers as if they're points along a line. These are two metaphors, and we can communicate them through the way we gesture. But these metaphors are also um, reflected in the materials we provide children. So, for example, we provide children with blocks, and we provide children with number lines. What's really interesting is the way that these metaphors lend themselves to different concepts. So, for example, if I was talking about negative numbers, for a child it's quite difficult to think about negative objects, but actually with a number line that becomes very powerful. If you're talking about fractions, you can do that with a number line. You can talk about fractions through a number line, but actually it sometimes makes a lot of sense to see the way that fractions, objects, be partitioned into different ways. So one of the, the outcomes of this research was there are these two overriding metaphors to think about numbers. And sometimes in education, what happens is children transition from using blocks, which are seen as sort of the early grades, towards a number line, which seems slightly more um, advanced when really it's both of these resources that can help structure the way that children think flexibly about different number concepts as they develop. And we can see that the adults tended more to think about numbers like they were objects, even though, as this picture shows, some did talk about numbers like they were um, on a number line. This then has implications for the design. So we talked about blocks and, and number lines and those are materials that exist, but it's now possible with technology to design ways um, for materials to respond to your actions. So I'm going to show a couple of examples. This one here um, is um, called the Mathematical Imagery Trainer, um, and this is Dor Abrahamson um, and in California. And in this design, children are learning um, about ratio. And what the design does is children's hands, um, the way they move 
proportionally from the table influences the colour of the screen. And it able to give them feedback, able to give them feedback on when they manage to maintain their hands in the same proportion, and if they don't, it changes colour, and that allows them to talk about their experiences um, afterwards. And afterwards, we see them drawing on gestures to communicate these ideas that reflect their experiences. So here we are talking about numbers as if they are points along a, an imaginary line from the table, and these two imaginary lines we can compare them. So there are other designs that use the number the number line um, as a metaphor to, to help children learn about numbers. So this is a design called Walk the Number Line um, and it was created by Tanya Link and colleagues which um, allow children to explore number magnitude um, through their movement from a particular point. The, the further along the line, the higher the magnitude, it allowed children to explore. And there are many other technologies that use this number line um, concept. We were interested in looking at technologies that, that use physical objects um, as a metaphor to help children explore um, numbers. So this is a design that we mocked up for, um, for a study and then we created um, a game that was um, shared with children at the Science Festival a few years ago. And in this, children manipulated numbers by grabbing groups of objects and moving them from one side to another um, as, as they had to balance the beam as part of the game. And this was really, um, it was really interesting the way that it do, did affect um, the way that children interacted with numbers and the way that they talked to us about the numbers afterwards, the gestures they created afterwards when talking about the number concepts they were dealing with. But it still lacked a bit of that physicality, the hands-on, the touch and the movement, the ability to use both hands to put objects in different places. So we, we had a sort of design challenge of, is it possible to digitally augment physical objects in a way that drew children's attention to particular number patterns? So the design concept was called Numbuco. And what Numbuco consisted of is sets of physical blocks that join magnetically. Interestingly, they, they didn't repel, they just joined. And I, I can tell you how another time. And as they joined, they changed colour. Um, particular colours, particular numbers attached. Um, one white, two red, three green. And allowed children to explore number patterns um, by adjoining and, and separating physical blocks. I'm going to show a clip now um, of a prototype of these blocks. So as you imagine, um, going from proof of concept to commercialise, commercialising um, a product like Nambuco is, is expensive. If you happen to be an investor watching this, then, then do come and talk to me. But we didn't want to stop there, so we wanted to create something that was usable. Um, so we created an app. If you have an iPad, um, you can search for an app called Nambuco. And that, it doesn't have the physical hands-on, but it still allows you to manipulate these physical blocks and, and see the way that technology allows us to represent numbers differently. Um, it also provides a little bit more research um, about the project, including a little video, which if you want to find a bit more about the project I've just described, um, if you just look up three ways hand gestures can influence how we learn, we use that project to talk about the way that we can communicate using our hands the different types of number concepts and the design implications I've just discussed. So the second project uh, I want to briefly um, explain um, was funded by the Carnegie Trust on the role of embodied cognition in computing education. And what this project wanted to do was understand the way we conceptualise core basic computing concepts. Now, we, we, weren't, we didn't want to start off with children because they may not yet have um, be aware of um, certain computing terms. So we started with adults. Adults that knew computing concepts but may not um, have any experience explaining them before. And this project is really important because in, in the fast-paced move towards helping children in computing education, there's a sort of lack of research underpinning the domain of, well, how do we think about com computing concepts such as data or algorithm, and, and what type of experiences will help us understand these? So in this project, we wanted to ask some adults who understood computing concepts but may not have experience explaining them to explain um, 12 different computing concepts and we were interested in the gestures they created when they communicated. Um, so this work hadn't been done before um, and it was really interesting because computing is quite an abstract domain and therefore to be able to see students or anyone explaining using gestures really highlights how 
certain concepts and a certain experience underpin the way that they were thinking about different ideas. In the interviews, students were just asked to explain the concept. They were asked to stand up. Well, they, we, it took place standing up. Afterwards, when we asked if they thought that was well, why we did that, only one sort of hint, indicated we might be looking at the way they were using the whole body to communicate. Here is a clip of one student um, of the 16 that we interviewed um, explaining the concept of algorithm. Um, algorithms are using computer science and maths. So it's um, when you follow certain mod steps to get a desired answer. So as we saw in that clip, um, students use quite a lot of gestures to communicate these concepts. And what we were able to do is to analyse these gestures to see what type of experiences um, were underpinning the way they were explaining. Um, many of these um, experiences were ones that you would imagine they were doing if they were computing. So for example, they might talk about lines of code that are related to code on a screen. But more often, it was more underlying metaphors. They were talking about computing concepts as if um, they were using metaphors of, of space and, and time um, and movement to be able to talk about these concepts. And what we were able to do is um, we, we categorised the range of gestures and we identified these two overarching embodied or body-based metaphors. Um, so the first one, um, they often talked about different concepts um, as if they were um, physical objects, you know, be it data or code, and these were things they used, they were pinching or grasping, and, and, and actually interesting, the size of their, their, their grasp reflected sometimes the size of, of, of the construct they were talking about. Other times they, they talked about um, computing processes as motion along a path, um, so they might talk about you know, a loop movement or, or how an algorithm happened over time. Very often they, they brought both these together, so they might talk about you know, a section of code that, that happened over time, and there was, there was variation that, that, that we've talked about in, in the range of gestures, but these two metaphors were really interesting because they, they have parallels with the metaphors that um, we identified in the maths project. And in some ways, this may be understandable. Uh, maths computing are related, and they're using these under, uh, you know, fundamental ideas of, of abstract ideas as physical things that we can hold and touch and, and how they change over time. We, we, we use the metaphor of movement. But what it does do is it makes us think maybe there are ways that we can communicate certain ideas exploiting these metaphors. And in many, way, many ways we do that already without thinking about it. So if we take the concept of data, we very often talk about holding on to your data, um, don't give your data away, um, the way we store our data. We have these sort of metaphors that we, we talk about. And so this has design implications. Maybe it's possible to design ways to make these concepts uh, to use these metaphors to help children understand these concepts, to take something as abstract as personal data. We know there are lots of designs nowadays for young children that capture personal data, and yet it's something that goes into a black box, that we don't really have a way for children to see this data. Well, maybe it's possible to talk about it or to represent it in a way that exploits the metaphor, that talks about it like it is a physical thing, something they should hold on to and think carefully about who they want to share, um, share the data with. Um, and so this is work that we are looking at at the moment in this project. So in this final project, um, we focus on science. This is a project, a collaborative project funded by the National Science Foundation in the US and the Wellcome Trust and Economic Social Research Council in the UK. It's one of five Science Learning Plus projects and ours focused on the role of the body in the way that young children learn about science concepts. So preschool children, three to six years old, and the implications this has for museum exhibit design, um, but also facilitation, the way that facilitators help children when they're there. The project um, was led by University of Edinburgh in the UK and the Patricia and Science Frost Museum in Miami, a, a lovely place to, to go and um, travel when lockdown's not happening. Um, and the, it was a lovely balance of informal science um, organisations and universities. And so it was, in a way it was, um, it was a really interesting collaboration between two different countries in two different time zones and different types of partners. So here is one I prepared, we prepared earlier. Um, it's a three minute animation um, and this gives a, a summary of the project and some of the um, ideas discussed about before. <laughs> Three ways embodied learning can improve informal science learning. Have you ever noticed the different ways that children show us what they're thinking? Perhaps how they move or gesture. 
Research is now revealing how particular body-based experiences underpin the way we think and understand the world. Science ideas are not static memories stored in our brains. They are a dynamic activity involving our brain, bodies, and the world around us. This research draws attention to how meaningful interaction can shape learning. We call this embodied learning. Science centers and museums already provide engaging interactive experiences. Embodied learning research suggests several ways we can expand these experiences to support children's science learning. Encourage children to communicate through gesture and movement. Embodied learning research encourages us to consider the diverse ways that children communicate what they understand. Their actions may indicate they are making a prediction. Maybe their hands illustrate ideas they are struggling to put into words. Sometimes it may help children if you encourage them to show you what they understand. Encourage adults to scaffold science ideas through gesture. Adults naturally communicate science ideas through their hands. This can help children understand, connect with a topic, and even create their own meaningful gestures. Think, how would you use your hands to communicate ideas such as gravity, water flow, virus, or balance? It may help children, therefore, for adults to be more purposeful in using gestures that are closely linked to the content being investigated. For this, Facilitators could be trained in the concept of embodied learning and representational gestures specifically. Design experiences to encourage meaningful movements. With embodied learning, we can focus on the movements and gestures that are key features of the concept, rather than just encouraging movement for movement's sake. In exhibit design, it is therefore important to encourage movements that relate to the science idea, as well as what is natural and intuitive for visitors. Here it helps to ask, how will children's interactions with the exhibit help them communicate science ideas later? New technologies, by responding to children's actions, offer exciting new possibilities for encouraging embodied learning. So, next time you are thinking about how to help children learn in your science center or museum, pay attention to how they use their hands and bodies. Help them move to learn. So that was the Move to Learn project. I just wanted to show a couple more clips in a bit more detail. Um, so the implication encouraged children to communicate in diverse ways. So our project and um, many others in the area have shown how people often reveal ideas through their gesture that they're doing through speech. And this is particularly important for children in the early years who are developing ways to articulate verbally. But even more um, specifically, children who may have had less opportunities to communicate verbally. Maybe children who've had less science talk at home, or children who are learning English as a second language, or children who just struggle uh, more to communicate verbally. So in this next clip, um, it's, it's showing in detail how three children are communicating their ideas, and they will gesture to different degrees, but what's really interesting is the way that they look at each other's gestures when communicating. Now in this video, I'm not gesturing to, to not prime, I normally would be. And in the video clips that we have of parents interacting with children, it was really interesting seeing the way that children would very often look at their parents' hands um, when they were communicating and would often copy back um, the gestures they had seen. So in this second implication, encourage adults to communicate through gesture. What we found was really interesting was the way that nearly, without exception, adults who we interviewed, science experts, museum facilitators, they gestured throughout their explanations. 
But often when we ask them afterwards, they weren't that aware that they had been gesturing, which opens up a really interesting potential that if we become a bit more aware of the way we use our hands, then we are able to communicate a bit more clearly. Now this is an example of a museum facilitator explaining friction, and as you can see, they are very articulate. There are a few things in this video that are of particular interest. For example, the range of different gestures, how some gestures such as heat may be not as obvious as other gestures such as friction, how sometimes if you look at the gestures, they can reveal a bit more information um, if you look in detail. So for example, with friction, um, look in detail at her hands. And, and finally, sometimes we saw um, where adults would gesture maybe slightly before they spoke. And, and this builds upon research that shows sometimes that we use our hands to sort of articulate and it actually supports our verbal communication. It's behind the concept of friction. Whoa, friction, okay. So um, friction is a force. Um, and it is, it, or it's generated when two surfaces rub against each other um, and sometimes you can get heat as well um, released during that, that kind of interaction um, more friction is generated when the surface, or the surface the properties of the surface um, result in different amounts of friction so if it's kind of a rough surface and you might get more friction generated or if it's a smooth surface we don't get as much friction generated Friction's helpful because if not, you fall over every time. <laughs> so the third um, implication, design experiences to encourage meaningful movements. Um, well, this, this principle um, highlights one of the things we found hardest on this project. Very often when we've been sharing this research, um, we've had people come up to us afterwards and say, can you tell us what, what type of gestures should I be doing for this idea or this idea? And this is where it's really difficult because what makes a good gesture um, involves many factors, including how meaningful it is to yourself and the person you're communicating with, but also how well it represents an idea. And there is no simple formula of this is how you represent an idea. And also, you know, for many ideas, there are different levels of understanding. So, for example, if you're talking about gravity, it could be about things falling down, or it could also be about things attracting one another. So, um, what we try, what we're trying to do at the moment, is to come up with a heuristic for things to think about. Um, but what is really important is to think about what type of experiences represent this idea or capture this idea and how gesture in a way is an abstraction. It captures certain parts of that experience in a way that it activates in the person who's listening those, those experiences, those shared experiences. And this is what makes it very, very powerful in the Science Centre that when children have these very, very embodied experiences where they are touching, playing and moving, Gesture provides a way to, for them to articulate these experiences and for, for parents and facilitators to, to communicate with them and help them draw upon these experiences. So we have um, a couple of examples here in the video where we've been designing a balance beam exhibit that takes these um, actions of balance and it links them digitally to a screen to really encourage them to think about the way things are moving up and down. And then we've been looking at the implications for a commercial toy that, that links to, to that exhibit there. We actually have our um, exhibit piece in the basement of Glasgow Science Centre and after lockdown we're really looking forward to, to evaluating that. So that's the Mood to Learn project. We've been fortunate enough in the last um, few months to start an extension that takes Mood to Learn um, to work with teachers to create resources for the classroom. So in this project we are creating four outputs together. Um, two of those are around um, a training resource, one is an animation, and a fourth resource um, output is a game. So the game is called STEM Charades, or STEAM Charades, and very simply, um, as we have been communicating the project, we play charades, and we encourage people to see how quickly they can get others to guess different science terms using their hands. It's, it's amazing how competitive adults can be in this situation. Um, but it also reminds me of when I was a primary school teacher of playing charades in the classroom. So for the output, we are identifying with teachers the, um, a range of about 30 to 40 science terms for children in the early years, creating together a good image for that, and then a series of activities of which will really encourage children to think about different ways they can use their hands to communicate, or different ways they, uh, the teacher can communicate those ideas there. 
So we've been doing that and we, we aim to have, so here's, here's a sort of prototype that, you know, what it will look like. And we aim to have this um, finished in, in the next few months. But we actually knew about this project um, last year. And during last summer, um, we started thinking about, well, how does this project um, contribute to what's going on in the world, the, the COVID-19 pandemic? And this is when we started thinking, well, core to move to learn is the idea that we can help um, communicate in different ways to help to understand help children understand complex ideas so ideas ranging from data and climate change to to um, pandemics and so this is where we decided we would create a pack of cards that have key vocabulary associated with the pandemic and it was a resource that teachers could use when they came back to classrooms to be able to help children talk about different ideas, their own experiences, and also their understanding of words such as virus or symptomatic or even things like zoonotic. We um, got funding to be able to send uh, 300 packs out to schools and you know, the resource has been downloaded multiple, multiple times. The URL you see here, um, if you click on that, then you are able to download um, the resource for free. But also, if you work with schools um, or with groups of children, then let us know and we will do our best to send you out for free a physical pack. Um, I'm going to show now a little clip of what the cards consist of. So one of the questions that came up when we were developing this pack and, and throughout the whole project was, well, how do you gesture certain ideas, particular ideas that are not very visible, like um, a virus? And so here I've been very inspired by the work of colleagues at, um, in the School of Education, such as Audrey Cameron, that have been developing um, a sign language um, dictionary for, for science concepts. And so by looking at these, it gives me an idea of, of the range of signs um, for different concepts and the extent to which they are representational. And here is a sign for coronavirus. So I found that um, clip very interesting because it was very representational. As somebody who doesn't um, know the sign, it was very clear what it was communicating. And so this this um, reflects something that's been argued recently. There's a lot of potential synergy between research into sign language and into more spontaneous gesture. So the fact that we communicate through our hands is, is not new, um, and we've known that for a while. What is um, more new or better understood um, is our understanding of the extent to what we reveal about the way we think um, when we gesture, and the extent to which um, our hands can reveal our conceptual understanding. And this has, um, I hope during the talk, um, I hope it's been clear the extent that this may have potential benefits for children, not only in understanding um, what they do and do not know about certain ideas and how we might be able to help them next, but also giving us ideas of how best to help them. And this could be through innovative designs that are able to capture children's actions and, and link that digitally. It could just be through the choice of particular um, hands-on experiences, ones that really help children to think about a particular idea that they can then later represent um, through gesture. Um, or it could simply be the way we communicate with children, the way we gesture. We know that we gesture a lot, but it's not something we've critically reflected upon and perhaps being a little bit more reflective of the way that we use our hands when we communicate with children and all learners um, maybe something that would, an easy win um, in terms of helping learning. So, next time you walk into a classroom, um, or perhaps when you're on your phone, um, have a think about what your hands are saying. I'm Andrew Manches, thank you very much.